Welcome back to the Untitled Mike Ashmore Podcast. My name is Mike Ashmore. We're on episode 17. Discovery Channel has Shark Week. We have Mike Week here at the Untitled Mike Ashmore Podcast. Our first Mike was Mike Ullman, an excellent episode that I encourage you guys to check out if you haven't already. He talks about his time in the big leagues, and we, we talked to Mike Antonini in this one. And, uh, well, I guess we talk about his time in the big leagues, too. If you look at his baseball card, it doesn't say he played in the big leagues, but he was in the big leagues, guys. He was called up twice by the L.A. Dodgers, and we talked to, to Mike about that. He's known as a phantom player. I hate that. A guy who got called up and never got into a game. Uh, make no mistake about it, Mike Antonini is a big leaguer. Whether there's games on the back of his card or not, the guy got called up, wore the uniform, he's a big leaguer. So we talk about that. We talk about the emotions of getting called up and not getting into uh, any games. Uh, we talk about all sorts of stuff in this. His, uh, his excellent run in the Atlantic League, uh, his time in the Mets system, all sorts of stuff. that I'm sure you, maybe when he was in Somerset, you didn't know about Mike Antonini, and now you will. And we also kind of talk about what's up next for him as well. Um, he has a YouTube channel uh, that he's going to be starting, some stuff on social media he's going to be doing. Uh, he hasn't totally closed the door on coming back this year yet, but you guys will just have to listen and find out more about what his plans are right now on episode 17 of the Untitled Mike Ashmore Podcast. All right, guys, welcome back to the Untitled Mike Ashmore Podcast. I've got a, a fellow Mike A here with me, Mike Antonini, guest number 17 on the pod. Welcome, sir. How you doing? Doing well, doing well. Thank you for having me. Thank you for uh, jumping on, man. I guess what's been keeping you busy these days? Oh, I've been doing a lot. I've been I've been painting the house, uh, studying for real estate, my real estate class, trying to train my four month old puppy Lambo. Um, also, part time student at the University of YouTube, I'm trying to learn as much as I can this time and put some different skills to to the test yes so you just cover the first two lines of my notes here i guess first off this uh this youtube thing here i guess you're you're looking at starting a channel did i did i motivate you a little bit uh yeah a little bit uh <laughs> i don't really know i still don't know what i'm doing with that i've been watching a lot of videos and like how to paint a room properly what to paint first and just what tools are good for different projects and uh my fiance was kind of getting a uh, little tireless with the quarantine so she says i'm gonna order a peloton and <laughs> i said okay well uh well if you're doing that i'm gonna i'm gonna vlog it so we got mike on a bike starting tomorrow at some point i will be videoing it i don't know when i will be able to upload it but hopefully the same day and just kind of take it from there a little add a little comedy a little my journey uh, I'm somewhat athletic riding a bike, and I'm sure it's going to be a painful week of beginning, but um, I'm looking forward to see what happens and just kind of have fun with it. And if I can help anybody on the way that are just starting out or just want to look at something and laugh, then uh, I'll be there for them. Are you having the same lovely experience learning video editing that I've had? Um, to be honest, I don't think I'm anywhere near where you're at yet. I'm, I'm still in like, talk to me like I'm five years old range. And I'm trying to learn. I'm just kind of, I'm not worried about it, but it's just going to be, that, I think that will add to the comedic part of it. Just me trying to figure out what I'm doing and just someone following along with that. And that's what I'm most looking forward to. Yes, you mentioned the uh, the new dog, Lambo, Lambo the Golden. You can follow Lambo the Golden on Instagram, of course. Um, I guess, how have things been going with the uh, the new edition? Oh, he's been great. He's awesome, especially in this time. He's getting spoiled even more than he would be normally, but I don't know how it's going to be when stuff goes back to normal. He's going to have some, uh, what's that? What's it called? Uh, I don't know. He's just going to be used to us being around all the time and I don't know how he's going to handle that, but he's been great. Uh, we take him out 20 to 30 times a day. <laughs> he's pretty good with the potty training though. He sleeps pretty much through the night till about five thirty six AM. So we got a pretty good routine and he keeps us on our toes and it's good to have someone to 
bouncing my ideas off when you're going crazy in this in this time. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm sure he's always very agreeable. So for people who, who who don't know you might not know why your dog is named Lambo. You're a big Packers fan. I, I've known that for a long time, but I don't think I've ever asked you why or how you kind of got into to being a big Green Bay guy. Um, I'm not really sure. I, I know in like third or fourth grade I had school pictures and I was in Packers stuff and uh, I played Pot Warner football and I was a big Brett Favre fan growing up. So instead of kind of growing out of it and having all my hometown Philadelphia people trying to say, you're from Philly, you should like the Eagles, I just was always against the grain in that aspect, and uh, I just stuck with it. Um, they had some years where they could bury me with the 4th and 26 Freddie Mitchell catch, and uh, every time the Packers beat them, I'm a bandwagon fan, and I shouldn't like them because I'm not from there, but you know how Philly fans are. Uh, we, we get a good uh, chuckle out of it, and it's always uh, fun talking trash back and forth. Oh, yes. Philly fans are, are quite talented at that, and I'll leave it at that. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess we do have to talk some baseball as well. I guess kind of the, the first thing from you know doing all this digging and all this research is it, it seems like you had a pretty unique uh, coaching arrangement towards the end of your, your time in high school. Is that right? Uh, yeah, uh, you could say that. My... Uh... Our varsity head coach um, got hurt at work, and my stepdad, who was the pitching coach at the time, filled in for that year, and uh, he was the interim manager for my high school that my senior season. Yeah, so what is what is that like playing for him? I mean, is he is he harder on you? Is he easier on you? I guess how does that kind of go? No, he was he was always harder on me than, but I'm pretty hard on myself. But he would always. Um, I guess it was type, his type of motivation to find that if I did 10 things good, he'd find the, the, the 11th thing that I did bad and kind of point that out. So it was always one of those type of um, player coach relationships and never player stepdad or any of that type of anything going on. But uh, it was fun playing there. And I mean, him coaching or the other coach, we had a very good team and um, we just do we had to and we ended up winning the Catholic League Championship. Yeah, so you end up going to the Gloucester County College. It's a D three after you get out of high school. I guess what kind of what kind of options did you have to, to kind of play college ball after high school? Um, not too many. I had uh, I, I was going to go to Shippensburg. I think I took a visit there and a couple other like uh, smaller D twos in state and my SATs weren't that great. And I I just knew that I want to play in time right away. And um, I met the coach from Gloucester. I had no idea about that school. Um, I just knew it was a JUCO and it was years later. I can, it was a perfect fit. I mean, I learned a lot in those two years there. It was great coaches. The coach is actually still there. Uh, Rob Bally is the manager and Greg Chu is the pitching coach. And those two guys playing for those two guys, it, it, it really helped me in my career. And I'm thankful for them to this day. So you end up going to Georgia College and State University. I can't imagine too many folks outside of there have heard of that. Um, I guess how, what was kind of the route to get you there, and uh, how did you get seen there? Um, well, Georgia College and State University, we always joke and say a school so nice they named it twice. <laughs> uh, it's in Milledgeville, Georgia, where uh, Big Ben got in some trouble there a couple of years ago. Yes. So he knows about it. Oh, yeah. But um, the, the coach – there, Chris Cassiano was the coach in West Chester, West Chester, Pennsylvania. So he was familiar with us. And our, after our sophomore year, uh, three of us from our national championship team in Gloucester went to Georgia College. So I didn't even take a visit. I had some stuff fall through with the schools I was eyeing up, um, Virginia Commonwealth and Coastal Carolina. Coastal being my number one school. And some it kind of fell through uh, scholarship-wise. Um, so I just decided to, uh, let's just build off this championship and go win another one down South. Yeah. Are, are scouts frequenting that area? I guess, are they usually there? I guess, how did you end up kind of, uh, getting on the Phillies radar in 06? Uh, yeah, the, we had one of my decisions besides those guys going there also was they had two left-handed pitchers in their rotation go, I believe in the third and fifth round or fourth and fifth round from there. So I knew they, there was chances to get the pro ball through that. It wasn't just D1 or bust in, in my eyes anymore. So 
Um, we had a scout day. There's a lot of scouts there. Uh, and I kind of, to be honest, I never even thought about being drafted until after my junior year or going into my midway through my junior year, I had a good scout day and started getting questionnaires and I'm like, Oh, this could really happen. And, um, so I filled out the questionnaires and see what happens. And, uh, I was fortunate enough to be drafted by the Phillies, um, in the 41st round. Yeah. So they offered you five grand. Um, I mean, was it, was there any temptation to, to go to that organization right away, given that you, you were a PA guy, was there any sort of hometown temptation there? Yeah. But the, the main thing that drew me away from them is I was the, the money changed significantly between the time the, the scout chip, I don't even know his last name, but that guy, oh God, um, he called me and offered me a certain amount and school and, I agreed to it, and then next thing I know, it's however many rounds later, and it was five and no school. And I called my coach, and I was excited about being drafted, but I'm like, am I going to get a shot at 41st round? I mean, my scholarship's worth more than that. Like, school alone is worth more than $5,000. So uh, so it was, I talked with my family, and I had an advisor at the time, and I uh, decided to go back to school and um, – I know it's hard to get drafted once alone, but I just knew that there was something I needed to do. I needed to go back there and finish either win a national championship or, or maybe I would get another shot, but I'm glad I did and it worked out for the best. Yes. So the Mets call the next year, 18th round in 2007. What is that moment like when you you find out that essentially that that's where you're going to be? Um, I was ecstatic because being like a, I wouldn't say an anti Philly guy, but like a, I like to always go against the grain with my friends and stuff, but now I was a rival. I was on the Mets, so it just made it. And it was the rival of the team that drafted me and kind of gave me the run around the year before, so it just kind of gave me a little mo- more motivation. And my time with the Mets was amazing. It's great coaches and coordinators, and I was very thankful to, to be in that organization. And the first guy that I saw um, off the plane, go down there in the van, get into the club, the – clubhouse to kind of get some equipment and stuff and pedro martinez is in a towel just fresh out of the shower he's rehabbing and i was just uh starstruck right there day one it was that was it was crazy i also i got an autograph he put a cy young award years on it and i didn't care if he was in a towel or not i needed <laughs> to get that ball signed did i mean did you have any sort of like conversation about pitching with them was it more just like hey can you sign this for me or how does that go because i wouldn't know what the, to do if, if pedro martinez just pops up in front of me yeah i didn't know either that's what i was like i was like i kind of double took i was like that's pedro and i was like he's in a towel i was like and the guy that i was in there with i was like joe ball i can get i, I want to get his autograph and he um went into the one of the closets and got a ball and i just said hi i'm new i was just drafted by the mets and uh it's nice to meet you. Can I ask you for your autograph? And that's kind of just did that because I didn't know how his day was or whatever. I didn't want to bother him more than just kind of get an autograph. And he was nice. And he always had a, a little uh, posse around him when we, he was outside because you'd see him the next few few weeks outside uh, throwing and doing his work. And it was just fun to admire someone like that. And it, it just puts it all in the uh, perspective right away. Like you're, you're here. Uh, these guys come through the same doors as you every day. So what did you know about Kingsport, Tennessee, before you end up getting sent there? <laughs> Nothing. I didn't know anything. I just knew that all my friends, I had a couple friends um, that I made through, um, I guess it's the short season spring training when you get there, and they all were going to Brooklyn, and I was kind of stuck going to Kingsport, which – I didn't know any better, but I just kind of wanted to be, go play with the guys that I've kind of built a relationship with in the first month that I've been in pro ball. But um, Kingsport was fun. We had a good manager, Donovan Mitchell. Um, he, I was there for, I think, a month, like 19 innings, I believe, something like that. And I went to Brooklyn and finished up and wound up losing um, in the New York Penn League championship to the Blue Jays that year. Gotcha. Um, the next year, I think, is is incredibly impressive, especially for an 18th round pick. You ended up in Double A uh, by the end of July in your first full pro season. How the hell does that happen? I have I, I don't know. I just was trying to compete and 
another motivational type thing is that that next year we're in spring training i just gave up one run in brooklyn and that was like to anyone that's played in the Penn League, especially Brooklyn, that's like the big leagues coming out of like going from high school to a JUCO to college. Like that's that stadium is awesome. There's ten thousand a night, and yep. you just it's first class. So uh, I do well there and uh, go to spring training. And same thing, I'm practicing with all my all those guys, all my friends, and uh, the little trickle down effect goes, and I get sent to Low A in the last uh, I would say last couple of days of spring training. So once again, I'm like, I got to get there. I got to get to St. Lucie. That's that's where all my my boys are. I just want to go play with them. So I just kind of just battled and did well there, and just worked my way to St. Lucie. And once I got there, um, I had I think seven starts, and I uh, just did really well. And very pitcher friendly league, and I just threw strikes and had good command. So that was I guess some of the characteristics they thought that. Um, they can move me up and I'd be able to pitch at the double A level that, that soon. Yeah. Um, moved really quick in 08 and then kind of mostly for whatever reason on their end, kind of stalled out a little bit in 09, stalled out a little bit in 10, I guess in retrospect, you maybe wish like they maybe had moved you a little slower in 08. Um, no, I think I, I had a good taste of each level. And, um, the only thing I would have changed between, um, 08 and 09 is uh, I had uh, over 160 innings um, and I went to play winter ball in Puerto Rico and I went from the beginning until the championship so that was another 50 innings so about midway through that next year uh, 2009 I was just kind of dead and Velo was kind of erratic up and down command was up and down and I, I got a chance in Buffalo and John Neese um, got called up and it, the numbers there kind of showed that I was a little erratic and I got sent back down. And I'm like, come on, I just gotta, I just want to feel strong and get another shot at, at AAA and see what I can do. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get that chance uh, the following year. Uh, made the most of it. Uh, Buffalo was a great town and traveling in that league um, was great. And I don't know, I just kind of didn't have the numbers that I think I should have had to get a chance of getting called up, but um, I battled and uh, they cleaned house. The Mets cleaned house the, after that off in that off season, and next thing I know, I get a call from Sandy Alderson and telling him I've been traded to the Dodgers. Did that happen two days after Christmas? Is that right? I think it was before Christmas. I think it was. I think it was December tenth. Okay, because I don't know why that number sticks in my head. It's officially December twenty seventh, but so it's like it's right around the holidays, and you find out you're getting traded. I guess what is? Are you expecting that at all? Is it on your mind at all? It's not at all. Uh, I knew I was in a good situation with the Mets, with their front office at the time, with Omar Minaya and uh, Tony Bernzar was the main guy in player development, and I was in a great situation with them. And when they got let go. I didn't know what was going to go on. I was like, my only thought was I have to uh, open up new eyes. And I ended up having to do that anyway because I got traded to the Dodgers. But, um, yeah, it wasn't something I thought of. But once it happened, I was kind of excited for that challenge and happy to get out of St. Lucie and that spring and go over to Glendale, Arizona and, and see what that was all about. What was 2011 like? Because I would have to imagine it's somewhat of a balance of they're trading for you and they want you, but at the same time, you're not really one of their guys. They don't really have much invested in you. So how much how much pressure is there in that 2011 season to really establish yourself in that organization? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you just hit the nail on the head. It was a lot of pressure going in there. They Obviously, they have their guys, and our starting rotation in AA was, I think, the uh, majority of them have some – major league time now and it was just ridiculous that pitching staff and um i was just trying to fit in do what i could and uh, my throwing partner and roommate at that time was nathan evaldi still good friends to this day um we just kind of grew and that they had a lot of good guys they kind of just uh, they had a lot of like southern southern guys that were just good dudes and um we kind of gelled and it, it helped me out right away to uh, learn these guys and um, just kind of fit in in spring training. And that helped me go into the um, 
the season a little more comfortable. But yeah, like you said, it was it's, it's trying to impress a whole new set of eyes, and what you've done in the past doesn't matter, and you got to do it now and and do it quick. Um, Southern League All Star that year. Uh, how how meaningful was that to have uh, been able to establish yourself that quickly and get to, to play in something like that? Uh, I was I was proud of that uh, accomplishment. Um, and in my eyes, I never really um, strive or, or based anything on trying to make an All Star team. I just knew if I had good numbers, um, I, I would get a chance at the next level. Whether that being a to double A, double A to triple A, and that that was my goal. And I missed out on a couple All Star teams because of promotions and stuff like that. So I, the the All Star thing never um, really hit home until I mean, it's looking back on your career and making those teams, and you meet a lot of different guys, and you end up playing with those same guys years down the road, and it's just a good experience. Yeah, um, 2012, uh, there's a lot of obvious things I'm sure when people think of you, they will think of. But when you think back to that year and that season, what's the first thing that comes to mind for you? Elbow pain. <laughs> it's, it started in spring training. I, I had some, something that was going on in my elbow. I didn't know what it was. And it wasn't every day, but it was significant when it was there. And that's, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, I saw like an acupuncture uh, guy and everything and kind of went broke camp went to um albuquerque and the first half of the season i would say before that the first three months of the season and on the road i was dominant and uh it led to me being called up for two different times uh no innings and after that second time uh they sent me back down and they asked me to drop down and i tried that um, one bullpen and drop down in Albuquerque is not a recipe for success. Hmm. It's the way the ball flies. But I tried that, and then they ended up trading for Randy Choate and Victorino and, and Beckett and all those guys. I don't know how, who was all involved in the trade, but they got Randy Choate, which was that guy that they were just asking me to be. So I decided to go back over the top, and at, at that time, it, I, I needed to shut it down. Yeah. Um, obviously, like you said, you got called up or pretty early in that year too. Were you, were you communicating, I guess, how much the, the elbow was kind of barking at that time? Cause obviously you don't want to, you want to balance being honest with not kind of hurting your chances to get called up. So I guess what was that kind of balance like for you at that time? It was a, it was a tough balance cause you don't want to be on the, the trainer report as having elbow soreness or any kind of red flag or question mark. So, um, I just went and got went to him and said I got some elbow stuff going on. Is there I need like an anti-inflammatory or something? And um, I was on that, but it was still kind of there was a deeper issue. But I was able to throw through it most of the time. Bullpens were shorter and trying every different kind of thing to make sure I was good enough on start day to go that hundred, hundred and ten pitches and try to put the team in a position to win the game. But um, eventually, it was just too much my velocity was dropping and i couldn't well, every time i would release it felt like a knife was going to, like right into my elbow and uh, that's when i had to say something so it was it's a hard balance to you don't want to get hurt being on the 40 man especially when you have good numbers going going right then because you don't know what's going to happen they could, they could designate you take you off and all, all sorts of things can happen so um I just want to try to get the opportunity and, and just see what would happen and just kind of go through it. And uh, I, I battled through it till I, I just physically couldn't throw anymore. Yeah. Um, the call up itself, this is something that you and I have, I've known you pretty well over the past couple of years. I've never had the balls to ask you about it. I guess there's no better time or format to do it than now. Um, the call up itself, I guess, first off, um, what is that moment like when you find up you're going up for the first time? I was I was pumped. I, I, we we're in Oklahoma City. Uh, after the game, we went across the street to, to some like country place to grab a drink and a beer. And um, without even getting my food yet, my the manager called, and uh, I was freaking out. Like I did something wrong. I was like, I didn't do anything wrong. What, what's going on? So I answer it, and he he tells me, Where am I? Can I get back to the hotel? And I was just. Like, I don't know how to even explain it. Words can't. I, I called my mom. It, it was pretty late because I was in Oklahoma City, so time difference a little bit. I think it was like one thirty their time, so I don't even know what time. 
But yeah, I was excited and pumped and just kind of a dream come true and just didn't know. I was just ready to get there. I was like, do I, have, you know, I don't even know if I have a suit with me. Like, what do I need? Like, that was my first thing. Like, I, I got a well, look the part. <laughs> but yeah, I, the next day I flew in there and I, I think I lasted four days there, one being an off day. And um, I got to... I got to pack the bullpen cooler a couple times. <laughs> uh, that was fun. But uh, Chris Chris Capuano, I don't know if it was the first or second time. It was him and Aaron Harang both had some kind of either back spasms or knee spasms, some kind of spasm. And I was uh, kind of the insurance in case they couldn't start. And unfortunately, both of them made the start. So I was in the bullpen, but never, never got the chance to record an out or an inning. Yeah, um, we'll kind of get into that aspect of it in a bit. But I guess are there? It's it's weird to ask without any game action. But are there are there are there fond memories of that time? Uh, I guess you got called up twice. Are there fond memories of those two call ups, uh, whether it be clubhouse or stuff you got to see or, or do or anything like that, even without getting into a game? Yeah, just just the experience going walking into that major league clubhouse with all the guys that you look up to and respect so much and it's just, and they, they welcome you with open arm. They're all great dudes. Um, it, it, just being kind of proud of yourself for, not for the first time, but like the, I, I made it here and all the hard work is, is paying off type of thing. And, um, yeah, I learned a lot in those couple of days and still have friendships with some of those guys that I met, uh, whether it being from spring training or that little bit of time that I was up there. But, um, I'm grateful for it, even though I'm considered a phantom player. Um, I was in the clubhouse. I was in uniform. I was there for the anthem. I was in the bullpen. Um, it was exciting. It would have been nice to uh, the second time um, when I was up there. Uh, with two trips from that that date, they were going to be in Philadelphia, and I was just praying that I could stay on and go there, but. It didn't work out. They ended up calling up Eovaldi to replace me because there's more righties in the lineup where they were going in Colorado than lefties. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned the term phantom player. I, I hate that. And I know that's, that's what it's called. Um, but when you kind of reflect on that and, you know, you got the, the opportunities to get called up but didn't get in, does it does it bother you? Because I guess from someone on the outside looking in, like that would piss me off pretty significantly. Uh, it, it, it bothers me that I didn't get the chance to just prove to them that I could I could do it. And the thing I want to do is see if I could stick. Like, it's one thing if I go and get shelled, and I, I understand, but not to get an inning or even see what I can, how I would react to the pressure and any of that. Uh, I think I would have done fine and had a decent career, but um, they had different plans and. I can't be mad at them. They gave me the opportunity to get called up. So uh, it's kind of, I just call it, a lot of guys call it getting a cup of coffee. I, I, I think I, I got the creamer, but I couldn't find the stir. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, I got to make sure I tell you, uh, while we're still doing this, I appreciate you talking about that. Because like I said, I've never never had the guts to, to bring that up to you before. So I know you probably are not thrilled getting into that stuff again and again, but I do appreciate you doing that, man. So uh, thank you for that. Oh, no problem. I'll, I'll free to talk about whatever. It's in the past, I don't have a whole, any grudges. And like I said, I'm thankful for the opportunity they gave me. I wish I could have had a, a call on that bullpen phone or a start. But um, it's a memory I'll always have, and uh, I, I'm, I can live with it. Yeah. Um, so you have the surgery, I think, to remove the bo- remove the bo- ugh, Jesus, remove the bone spur at the end of the year. Um they end up letting you go later on and then that spring training in 2013. Um, it seems like that kind of started a, a bit of a, a whirlwind for you going forward. I guess, A, what is it like when you find out that they're they're letting you go? And B, what is kind of the process to, to find a job after that? Yeah, when, in, in 13, when they, they called me in to let me go, I was kind of in shock. Um, I... I think I kind of made them upset with my decision. I got a second opinion from the Mets doctor um, on my elbow. The, the Dodgers doctor wanted me to wear a bone stimulator and come back. And I went to the Dr. Alchek in New York, and he said, if you were on, if you were with us, I would have the surgery. So um, I, I went with the surgery, and I don't know if they were happy with that. But um, 
it was pretty quick spring training turnaround. They said they'd ease me into it, but I know the first spring training game I was throwing two innings. So uh, the velocity was down. I think it was like 88, and which I was kind of happy with at that time with the progress because it only had been like three months. But um, they called me in and let me go and said they didn't have any innings for me. But I know the, the business side of it is – I was called up the year before, and I'm going to make a prorated amount that year. And they have guys that are younger that they can call up and can pay him the minimum AAA salary. So I kind of get it. Um, but yeah, I was in shock with that. So after that, I got released and went to Camden River Sharks in the uh, good old Atlantic League. Mm-hmm. Yeah, is, is part of that just wanting to you know pitch closer to home? I guess what is kind of the thought process in ending up in Camden? Yeah, that was a um, pitch closer to the home type thing. I knew I knew I didn't want to be done, but I also knew that um, it was so late in the spring training with two days left to camp that finding a job was going to be next to impossible because every team is in that same situation at that time. So I needed to go somewhere to pitch to try to wait something, wait an injury out or wait whatever, a, a, an opportunity out. But um during that year, and I started in the bullpen there. I was in the bullpen, and I was doing well, and they asked me to start, and I don't know how many starts in, but I know it was in Southern Maryland. I remember to this day, and um, once again, something in the elbow just wasn't agreeing with me, and I ended up getting the pin that was in there uh, removed, and that seemed to have helped from for the next couple of years, but the underlying issue was never really discovered and fixed until 2017. So those four or five years just battling, uh, like I would feel perfectly fine up until about the 80, 90 inning mark. And then it would, it would come back. So I had a, a stress fracture in my elbow that would heal in the off season and I'd be fine. And then right around the 80, 90 inning mark, it would just go to shit again. Yeah. Um, Jackals the next year, you don't really see a lot of guys with your kind of track record end up in that league. Um, I guess before I kind of ask about that season, was there, especially with the elbow too, we can swear as much as we want, I guess with the elbow stuff too, um, was there a thought to, to being done after that or were you always looking to come back and keep it going in 14? Um, there's never, no, I never really had a thought of, of shutting it down because I didn't want to go out that way. Um, for that going into that year, uh, getting the pin out and then get starting my throwing program going into 14, I had no real offers. Um, I had one from Bridgeport, but I wasn't really, um, I had seen that place from being in Camden. I wasn't really on par with going there. So yep. I kind of waited it out, waited it out. And, um, I talked to Joe Calfa Pietro from the Jackals and he kind of was, kind of pressure me with like money and different living situations and stuff like that. And there wasn't anything really opened up because I just got released and I was hurt and then I got hurt in the Atlantic league. So I don't know how many red flags were on my name at that point for guys looking for pitching. So, um, I went with the, the Jackals and, um, Joe Calf Pietro. And I mean, uh, that was a tough league. That was one of the toughest leagues in my career. There's four teams, in that league, just pitching. We would play a couple crossover games with the American Association, but just having to be ready every every start for the team that you may have just faced five days ago, and it happened a lot. That was a battle, and uh, I did well in that league, and then um, we lost in the championship, and the following year, I just knew I needed to get to the Atlantic League because I, I couldn't have done anything better in that league, and I didn't get a sniff, so um, then I was fair game to go to whatever team in the Atlantic League, and uh, I ended up in Bridgeport. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you say that that was a really challenging league for you, because, I mean, you set the the single-game strikeout record in that league, you're an all-star in that league. I guess how much of that was, A, like you said, kind of, you know, facing a lot of the same teams at the same time, but also kind of with some of the younger guys in that league and less experienced guys in that league, how much of that is kind of their approaches, too? How much did that affect you compared to what you were used to? Yeah, that, that, that's that that was that's one of the main things. There, there's guys from all over um, organizations or non or just college guys, and it's just a mix of 
different approaches. There's like you're used to double A, triple A. You guys have a plan. You throw something, they're not going to swing at it. They're going to wait for their pitch, and they kind of have a, an idea at the plate. Where this, that's why I say it's most challenging because you don't know what some of these guys are going to do. They could, the guy could have been playing the College World Series last week, and now he's playing for uh, Quebec, and he's just going to swing at anything just to kind of show that he wants to hit and get out of there type thing so um that's why i think it was so challenging but those guys were great man i don't know if you have gotten a chance to meet or talk to isaac pavlik from that but that guy is amazing Uh, a lot a lot alonzo harris was on that team he's a stud um joe dunnigan was a donkey he might have hit like 27 to 30 home runs there like we had a very very good team and um, I mean that made it easier. I didn't feel like I shouldn't be here, type of thing. It was like once I was there, I was pissed, and I wanted to. I just, I just had a pissed mentality against everybody, not with my teammates, but just against whoever I was going up against. I just wanted to shove it every start. Yeah, um, you said that your outside impressions of Bridgeport, uh, and no one can certainly blame you here. Your outside impressions there were not so great. So I guess why ultimately decide on them? Um. I don't know, because uh, Paul Herman, the year before when I decided to go with the Jackals, I was in contact with him, and I just wasn't feeling it at that time. And like you said, the at first glance type thing. And after doing what I did in the, in the Can-Am and knowing that maybe I should have went with Paul the and kind of got my foot in the door a little a year earlier, um, I just decided to go to Bridgeport and uh, – the rest was kind of history. Um, I met my fiance there, so that was a good thing. Um, I got my second chance. I got picked up by the Angels yep. out of there. Um, unfortunately, the same thing was going on. It was I was having a great year, and I was right around that inning mark. And once I signed with them, I had a couple starts in the elbow. Kind of went down the shore again. Yeah. Um, go back to Bridgeport, back-to-back All-Star games there. Um I guess, again, surgery in 17 to, to fix that reoccurring stress fracture thing. You kind of joked around with me in a story that you and I did back then, kind of felt like you had half a Home Depot in your arm at that time. Um, uh, again, are you are you always committed to, to going forward? Because a lot of people who had been through what you've been through elbow-wise wouldn't. Um, yeah, at that point, I knew um, – I still wanted to play, so I needed to get a fix to have that opportunity. Like I said before, I, I didn't want to go out with an injury. I wanted to go out the way I wanted to go out. So after that, midway through Bridgeport, um, I kind of shut down and uh, used a bone stimulator, met with their doctors, did all this stuff. And um, the plan was to start throwing in September to build up to go to winter ball. That was my plan from once I got hurt. And the coach was on par with that, and uh, that was nice of them to to do that. But um, I went down to Venezuela, and it still wasn't it still wasn't right. So once I got sent home from there, that's when I looked into it um, more seriously, and I contacted the doctors in Connecticut, and it was a very long wait and very bad communication with them. So I talked to our team trainer, Eric Inventura, who was a phenomenal trainer from Bridgeport. And she put me in touch with a doctor in Philadelphia. And he was, he worked with the Phillies a little bit and hand wrist and stuff. So I went there and he said, I can get you in next Wednesday. And it was that fast. And I mean, I didn't have very very many options. I just knew I wanted to pitch. And he said that he can get me back on the field. So I, I bought in. So I guess it's kind of a little bit of a sidetrack maybe, but what the hell exactly is in your elbow right now? There's plates and pins and screws <laughs> and all that. I guess what's what's going on in there? Yeah, I think instead of half a Home Depot, I think it's just aisle 11. <laughs> um, there's a, a plate and seven screws, um, and it's wrapped from, like if you bend your elbow at a 90, it's a little bit wrapped around that electronon. It's the knob of the elbow, mm. and that's in the back of that is where I kept having the stress fractures. So there's a, a plate and seven screws right around there. And I'll tell you, since I got back on the field after that rehab, it has been, I feel as close to as 100% as I can. I feel great. I might have a little lack of um, 
it's like being able to straighten my arm out all the way by like maybe three to five degrees. And I was like, that's fine. I don't care. Yeah. As long as I can pitch, I can, I'm, I'm going to go. Yeah. Do you feel that in your everyday life at all? Are there times when you're moving around and you're like, uh, sh- there's the plate in my elbow or is it not like that? No, I don't, I don't really feel it too much. There's certain, uh, exercises, um, planks, like single arm planks on that one side is, uh, basically a no-go or kind of limited it to like a 30 second because anything longer you can kind of it's just not comfortable in there but other than that it's been it's been fine I, I no complaints and i can't believe that i wish this would have been done in 2012 it would have i think helped me out a lot but uh, i'm grateful for the finally getting it fixed and just being able to um, persevere through that to prove to myself that I was right, something was wrong, and once it was fixed, I could rebound and get out. Yeah, so tell me about coming back to a men's league in 17 to eventually get ramped up to go to Somerset in 17. I guess, what is that whole process like for you? Yeah, uh, I, was in, I was in contact with uh, John Hunton for a little while, um, seeing if he had any openings once I was done my rehab, and uh, also Bridgeport a little bit too, because Paul was still there. Um, and I, one of my buddies from my hometown, he was a player coach for a men's league team that played across the street from my house. And I was like, do you mind if I get some innings and just kind of work my way until something happens? And he was ecstatic. He was all on board for it. So I went there and threw a couple innings and was throwing bullpens and they had a lot of good guys and getting to work with those guys and a lot of college level players and just, talking to them and just going through the, the daily thing and just them seeing how I work, me seeing how, like their approach and just talking the game and just getting back in the swing of things. And it, it helped me a lot because I needed that because I had some time off and I just wanted to get back. And, and that was a, a, a good stepping stone to put myself back in Atlantic League. Yeah, I remember you came back and you shoved. Uh, were you surprised at all to have done that well for, for that stretch after coming off of what you did? Uh, yeah, I, could, I would say I was a little surprised. I didn't know how I was going to respond. I can tell you I can. I know I can throw two innings or three innings, but I don't know how it's going to rebound once I'm up to five, six innings or uh, of uh, like 80 to 100 pitches. I'm not really sure how it's going to respond. And uh, I communicated that with John and, and Brett, and they were on par with it. Uh, my first start, I think I went uh, – three innings um or yeah three innings something like that three and a third and we just kind of built from there and it, every start it, it just it felt fine so it's like let's let's go a little more and it kept feeling better and better and um i'm thankful that they worked with me because if i was just thrown into a start to go five innings i don't know how it would have all turned out but um i'm grateful that they kind of had that little plan in place and worked with me and uh, I'm very grateful. I love Somerset, the fans, the, the front office. It's like everyone, we consider it a family and um, great people up and down that whole organization. Yeah. Um, 18, your, your first full year in Somerset, you put up absolutely ridiculous, stupid baseball stars, as we were talking about off camera, off pod numbers, 141 ERA over a full season, but you don't get an opportunity to get out of there. Um, is there at that point for a player in your position? Is there is there frustration mounting at that time where it's kind of like a, a what the hell do I have to do kind of feel, or what is kind of your mindset at that time? Yeah, it's kind of thought uh, I just having those type of numbers and going into that season that that might have been the second hardest season in my career just because I had asked to go into the bullpen, um, trying to for basically two reasons to, to try to maintain my health because I didn't know if I could last the full season still. Cause it was still within a year from my surgery. Sure. And, um, I knew that if nothing did happen, the way to make money is winter ball. And I wanted to be at least healthy for that at, by the end of the year. So I went to, the, um, talk to Brad a little bit and, um, he was on board with me going to the bullpen. He didn't really understand why at first because I was doing good as a starter, but, we, I kind of talked about it, and he understood. 
so just and then the first team meeting he he's like going around telling everyone their roles or like what it needs to be ready and i was supposed to be ready for winnings one through nine and i was like oh my god oh. so uh, i think i led the league in stretching that year but um we had a lot of donkey arms and a lot of guys with a lot of good experience so i was grateful to kind of find a role and by the end of the year i was in uh, i was in the seventh inning role and um, just learned a lot from guys like Logan Kensing and Ryan Kelly and Molly and all those guys. Dustin Antelon was my throwing partner and just guys that have done it and kind of how to prepare because till then I didn't really know how to come out of the bullpen. I would do a full 40 pitch, get, get hot for a start type thing. And I needed to kind of slim that down and, and go into the game effective, but kind of do it quicker than what I was normally used to. Yeah, um, that 18 team, that was one of my favorite groups to be around. And I say this for pretty much everybody on that 18 team who I talked to on this thing. But, I mean, I loved being around that team. And um, there was a pretty infamous last night of that season where a lot of the guys from that team kind of hung out for a while after that last game. But just for, from your perspective and being on that team, um, what was it like being a part of that group? Because it just seemed like they all collectively gelled so well. Yeah, that, we there were countless times where we were – um, in the locker room after games for hours, just talking and just doing things teammates do, just hanging out. And that you don't see that a lot. You see a lot of guys. Well, after the game's over, they, they shower and get out of there. there. There's something better for them to do. And and I get that. Guys have families and stuff. But even then, we have like Velo would bring Gavin into the locker room. John brings Logan in the locker. Like it's you got Scott Kelly running around. Like he, it's just. I don't know how to explain it. They, they do a great job of finding quality people to be on that team. And, and 2018 was probably the, the epitome of that. that. That team was amazing, like you said. And Unfortunately, we didn't win the championship, but, I mean, there, there's friendships that are going to go a long way. And it's just, I think it's based on the whatever they do in their recruiting or, or signing policy to get got quality people into that locker room, they do a great job of it. And I mean, it's, it's second to none in that place. Yeah. Uh, get to go to Mexico midway through last season. I guess how much of that is kind of maybe realizing that that opportunity is not going to come for you and how much of that is uh, what was coming with the rules. I know you were a pretty vocal guy um, kind of against some of what was happening in the Atlantic League last year. <laughs> yeah, those rules were pretty softball um, I didn't know what to expect really going into that year, and um, somehow I landed the closer role, which was shocking to me. I didn't know. I just thought I'd be maybe bumped from the 7th to the 8th inning because we have a guy like Broadway with a power arm. But yeah. Um, I got the chance and I just ran with it. I just tried to execute because I was a starter. I know I don't want to lose the guy's win if he has it or I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be that guy. So I just, it was a totally different mindset than starting and any other relief of, um, work I had done. But um, yeah, I get the opportunity to go to Mexico, which I negotiated to stay for the all-star game because that was important to me last year. Yeah. Um, and then, get to Mexico and a wholly different side of baseball that it's uh, it's a lot of small ball a lot a lot of different things that I wasn't really used to who cares about your arm you pitched the last three days but we need a win so you're out there and it's kind of a it's kind of a pitch into the wheels fall off mentality down there which I wasn't used to and uh, and sometimes if the wheels fall off too quickly then you're out there till there's no car (laughs) yeah so that that kind of opened my eyes uh it was a great experience uh good guys on that team as well uh i I just want to be able to say that i played mexico winter league and summer league and got that experience um i was i was happy with it but it it made me want to be a starter again as much as I was throwing out of the bullpen. I was like, I'd rather just save all my bullets and throw once every five days than every day of the week. Yeah. How big of an adjustment was it to then come back from Mexico to Somerset with, first off, the the style of play in Mexico, and secondly, the rules having, uh, a lot of the rules having changed um, since you last were in Somerset? Yeah, it was a lot different. I forgot about the... um, 
the the no pickoff and yeah. all that stuff. So guys are getting monster leads, and I'm like, what is going on? And then I kind of, I mean, I, I knew it in my mind because I would go over the rules with guys in in the clubhouse and just kind of we would joke about it a lot during the year. But then when you're in the game, it's like, man, this really affects me. I need like that's a thing to be in an organization to get called up. You got to be able to hold runners, and now it's like it doesn't even matter if you can do that. The catcher has no chance; he's getting a lead. It was just it was the automatic strike zone. Oh my god, you don't know. You could throw the same pitch five times and three would be strikes and two would be balls. It's just usually when I think both pitchers and hitters like that consistency, whether you have a guy like Kubiak who's going to go out there and pound the strike zone, might get a ball or two balls off the plate, but you know he's going to be around the zone. Like That's expected. There's different guys that have worked to earn the different things, kind of like a Greg Maddox. You know he's going to throw a lot of strikes and it's going to be around the zone. You yeah. just go into the, you know that. But here, it's just like you throw one and the umpire just kind of puts his arms up like the computer said it was a ball. There's nothing I can do. Like, And then the, the high and low was a little off, I think, with the, um, sometimes curveballs or sliders were very, very low and they were being called strikes. And then you throw a fastball at the belt and that's a ball. It's just a lot in the game that uh, that's changing and evolving and it's not something – you want to be the guinea pig of when you're trying to fight for your career. But I mean, I, I get it. And in the long run, I I understand they're trying to do different things for the game, but I think there's other aspects that can be looked at other than changing the rules of a game that's been around for quite a while. Yeah. I've heard varying opinions on this from, from different pitchers. I'm kind of curious to pick your brain on it. Did, Did the zone vary based on ballpark or is that not true in your experience? Uh, no, I think it was just bad all around. Just, <laughs> it, 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 if you could picture a capital I, that is what I feel like the strike zone was. Instead of it being a, a square or kind of rectangle from top to bottom, it was like a capital I. Because if you were inside or outside and midway up, then that's a ball. But like, uh, it was just very, very weird how it read. If it's, um, if it's done right, do you think it can it can work? I think it could, but uh, I still believe in that um, consistency thing with pitchers. Like I was saying, like a Maddox, that you, you know he's going to pound pound it down the way, and and he might get a ball or two off, but he's earned that that type of thing. But if you're if you're grooving and you get that pitch, um, I think hitters are okay with that because they're they they know what's going to be called a strike and what's not. And now, um, is the track man reading my shoulder to my upper knee or is it working today? Or is it not working today? That just changes of a lot of guys approaches that I've talked to. It's just, we don't know what's going to be called a strike. So if you see something good early in the count, you got to jump on it rather than having that approach and being able to do what you normally would do. Yeah. Um, get to go to the Dominican uh, this winter. Get to go back to Puerto Rico for a little bit this winter. I guess what are those experiences like for you? Uh, it was great. The Dominican was that was my first time being there. Um, it was that place is that place is awesome. It's safe, unlike Venezuela. Yeah. Um, food's good, and I had some teammates that I knew, like Kubiak was down there, and then uh, Espinal and Jimmy Paredes. Uh, those guys were all down there. So um, it was comfortable. That, that that was a very good team, but uh, very much a revolving door of guys just to try to get into that round robin at the end. So um, that was a great experience. And then Puerto Rico was kind of a um, – I've been there before. I didn't really necessarily want to go back because I know the money's not as much as uh, Mexico or Dominican or Venezuela. But um, I just – I don't know, something – I wanted to go there and – I went and we won a championship and now I have three championships in Puerto Rico. And I'll tell you that last game, um, I think I might've had Corona. Uh, I don't know what I had. I was, we had like three guys on the team that were really sick and we all lived in the same uh, housing complex and our closers in the game. It's a, we're up one and there's two outs and first and third. And they call down for me to get loose. 
and <laughs> I couldn't. I was freezing. It's probably eighty something degrees. I'm freezing. I can't even like see straight. I'm so sick. So I get up there. I throw the first. I'm pretty accurate as a thrower. Yes. I throw the. I throw the first three. Um, to my glove side. Um of the catcher miss him by like five to eight feet like not even he couldn't even catch it three in a row and the bullpen coach is looking at me he's like you all right i'm like i i, I don't know so then uh, i throw a couple warm-up pitches and he asked me if i'm good so i go in the game and uh games on the line championships on the line kind of thing closer in the game i wasn't really anticipating you normally have a pretty good feel of the game and once the closer was in i, I was like ah, i'm good for the day i'm not gonna i'm not going in but um, I end up going into the game and I tell the catcher, I'm like, I need to throw a changeup. And <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what my fastball might be, 40 right now. Hmm. So I throw a changeup and he grounds out the short and we got out of it. And, and I looked at the trainer and I was like, I think that's all I had. And he's like, because <laughs> I had told him how sick I was. And, but we ended up winning the championship. I didn't really celebrate because I felt awful. I just went to the doctor and got some medicine and went home and slept the next four or five days. So is that like some don't drink the water down there? Type, or do you, do you think you actually had it? No, I was really, I had, I had fever, um, sore throat. Um, I had a cough even, I had a cough for like three weeks once I got back here. So I don't know what I had something. I don't know. It might've been the flu. It might've been something, but I just say maybe I had Corona cause that all, that all that was symptoms, but I just knew I was bed bound for five days and I just, it was miserable. Well, glad you're all right, obviously. Um, I think a lot of people have noticed that we haven't seen your name pop up on, on a roster for this year. I guess it's hopefully a fair question to ask uh, what the future holds for you. Yeah, like I said in the beginning, I'm, I'm in real estate school. I'm kind of decided to step away from the game, I think, for now. I don't know if a winter ball job or something like that could open up. I'm going to stay in shape. I'm going to throw um, type of thing. But as far as going through the season of, of an independent ball league, I, uh, I'm 34 years old, going to be 35. Um, I just kind of decided it's time to go into the real world and try to make some money. And I, I would love to play until they tore a uniform off me, but um, I kind of want to take that next step and kind of plant some some roots somewhere and have some money to be able to do so yeah it sounds like the door is open a little bit but i guess knowing that you know you may have pitched in your last game is that is that hard to accept in any way um no it's uh, i'm gonna miss that competition and the reading the swings and the sequences i love doing that and uh just that whole competition aspect but um I'm fine with my last pitch being an out, and we won the championship, and it's a hell of a way to go out through all these surgeries and um, injuries and not knowing if I'm going to play again and not knowing if I can play again type thing. So um, as of right now, I'm, I'm at peace with it. This whole um, corona shutdown thing has made it a little easier because you're not seeing it you're not hearing about baseball it's just like no sports no nothing so this this thing has made it a little easier but uh, i i miss it i miss the just the the locker room the everything part of it um, that every baseball player athlete misses that whole brotherhood type thing but um i'm at peace with it and uh, maybe i get into coaching down the line i was trying to find a school to um to coach and finish my degree, but I couldn't find the fit this off season because of the timing and stuff like that. They hire coaches at a certain time. And what I was looking for was kind of like a two for one where I can coach or coach and finish school, but nothing really worked out. So I'm up, I'm open to coaching and, um, going to get my real estate license and find some people that have dream homes <laughs> yes uh well, i think you'd make a great coach you, you've certainly made a a great podcast guest uh it's been freaking awesome to catch up with you for the past hour man uh, i've enjoyed the hell out of getting to cover you the past couple years and uh i know whatever the future holds for you uh, whether it be real estate or just hanging out with lambo or let's get back to baseball man i know it's going to be uh, very successful for you so i wish you all the best in uh, whatever happens for you down the road bud Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm going to be uh, in your ear about these um, these YouTube videos and stuff because Mike on a bike needs to take off to help pay for this Peloton. 
Well, uh, Mike, with his podcast, we'll do the best to, uh, to, teach, you, to teach you a little bit with uh, iMovie, man. So, uh, again, thanks for everything, man, and I uh, look forward to keeping in touch with you down the road. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right, guys, thank you so much for checking out this episode of the Untitled Mike Ashmore Podcast, the UMAP, as the kids call it. Um, this was a lot of fun to catch up with uh, Mike Antonini, just a, a guy who I, I got to know pretty well over the past couple years and a, a guy who I'm very fortunate to have crossed paths with and fortunate to uh, have called a friend, uh, to still call a friend, of course, uh, over these past couple of years. It's been, uh, been great getting to know him, and it was great to uh, kind of showing a little bit more of his personality as well in, in this podcast. And I hope you guys maybe feel like you know him a little bit now too. So uh, episode 18 is coming up soon, the next few days. Mike Week continues at the UMAP. Mike Francoso will be our next guest on the Untitled Mike Ashmore podcast. He'll be followed by Mark Minakazi as guest number 19. And then we're going to start taping these again, as you can see. The man cave is a little empty here at the apartment. We're in the, the process of moving from the apartment to our new house, and we'll start taping some episodes while we're there. But until then, stay safe, stay inside, wash your damn hands. Until the next one, I'm Mike Ashmore for the Untitled Mike Ashmore Podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening slash watching slash your support, and I'll see you guys soon.